Judge, thank you. In, in this uh, in this presentation, we do have crime scene photographs. So as we introduce evidence, I would again ask the court to instruct me not to broadcast anything that we display on the screen. Thank you. As previously stated, please do not show anything on the screen that's sensitive in nature. If you could, please turn the cameras around when that's being presented. You may proceed. The victim's families aware as well. There will be some graphic photographs. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. and at this time, if anyone would wishes to leave the courtroom, you may leave the courtroom at this time as sensitive information will be shown on the screen. That, that being said, people, you may proceed. Thank you. Sir, how are you employed? Uh, by the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. How long have you worked with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? I'm in my 17th year of employment there. Okay. What do you do there? Um, my technical um, <coughs> name is a Forensic Laboratory Investigator Leader, which um, is a vast array of supervision. I am um, the latent print supervisor um, of five individuals. I also am the crime scene supervisor, which we have seven people on that team. I'm also the crime scene response team uh, supervisor, which I have 10 team members on that along with an evidence technician program that I run that has over 100 technicians. Okay. So you're a part of the crime scene investigation, would that be correct? That is correct. And sir, we're not going to go through all the qualifications because it is a Miller hearing, not a, not a jury trial, but it's true that you've been qualified many times over in crime scene analysis? That is correct. <clears throat> how often do you conduct a crime scene analysis? How often is this part of your day-to-day? Not every day. Um, our, you know, the the um, the teams that I run do a lot of crime scene investigations that are out of my um, realm. But I've been a crime scene investigator for my this is my 25th year, um, starting with Pontiac Police and with Oakland County um, Sheriff's Office, and I've done hundreds, if not thousands, of crime scenes throughout my career. I'd like to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? Yes, I do. Were you working? I was working in the office, yes. Okay. And were you the on-call crime scene supervisor in that day? Yes, I was. Do you remember being called to the Oxford High School that day? Yes, I do. Tell me where you were when you received that phone call. I was sitting in my office um, at 38 East, uh, the sheriff's office, and my captain, Captain Quisenberry, informed me that I needed to respond to the Oxford High School. And you responded there? Yes, I did. <coughs> Tell us what you do, please. What are some of the steps you take when you process the scene? Um, the initial thing is um, an assessment, a crime scene assessment, um, to see what we actually are um, looking at as far as the actual crime scene. So to get an idea of what, um, what resources I may need or what um, processes we have to actually perform uh, before we actually start um, photography or anything else. Okay. Now, <coughs> at the Oxford High School, this is an extremely large crime scene, that'd be correct? That is correct. And before you conducted your analysis, did you do a walkthrough? Yes, I did. Tell me about that, please. Um, there were several individuals um, that were involved. It was my entire team, which I had eight team members, along with our special investigations unit. There were several um, sergeants and lieutenants that uh, walked through the scene um, because there was different intelligence that we were receiving at different times. We wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. <coughs> Now, I'm going to approach the witness. This is uh, Exhibit 46. I may approach Judge. Yes. Now, this has already been stipulated to as admission. I just want you to have that and refer to it if necessary. That's your report that you authored regarding the crime scene analysis in this case. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Now, it's obviously a lengthy report. We're not going to go all the way through it, but I am going to show you some photographs. It's also been stipulated to that already admitted the evidence. I'll, I'll take you through that through the PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Um, but I just want to confirm with you, you've seen our exhibits. These were all taken on, on November the 30th, 2021 at the Oxford High School? That is correct. So, directing you now to the screen, this is a, a map of the Oxford High School and we have blue markings on this map. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Did you uh, make these markings? Um, actually, um, one of my team members um, had actually placed the numbers on the schematic of where the evidence pieces were collected from within the school. Okay. Now, can you tell me, please, what these numbers signify? Uh, they're item numbers that coincide to a specific piece of evidence that was um, given a specific number and then collected um, from the crime scene. Okay. When we're talking about evidence, are we talking about shell casings? Yes. Can you tell us, please, what, what exactly is a shell casing? 
Um, so what we a, the technical, technical term will be a fired cartridge case. It is a um, a portion of a cartridge that ejects out of a semi-automatic weapon when the, the the firearm is fired. So the bullet goes out the end of the barrel, and the fired cartridge case will eject out the side of the weapon, typically um, out the right hand side of the weapon. Okay. Now Oxford High School is a single story building. Is that true? That is correct. Okay. And did it appear to you from your investigation that the shooting was contained to the 200 hallway? Yes, it was. And just for a little bit of background, the, the hallways are named for the number, the number of classrooms in the hallway. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So throughout your investigation, were you able to determine the path that the shooter took? Yes. It, it appeared to uh, be on the south side of the, the school um, and then headed a little bit east and then to the north. Okay. And this is directly to a uh, laser pointer with the map here. Now this is a bathroom that's directly adjacent to room 258. Did you come to learn that the defendant was in that bathroom directly before he opened fire? Yes, I did. Okay. And if you could tell us the path that he walked, please. Then he would go directly east, which is down, and then um, go into the north, which is a little bit to the right, and then follows that hallway there. Okay. And where did the, um, the evidence of the shooting scene stop? Um, in front of room 213, which is right there okay. on the right-hand side of the screen. And of course, sir, you're aware that at that point, the defendant turned around and continued to walk in reverse path down the 200 hallway. Is that right? That is correct. Now, I'm going to take you through some crime scene photographs following the path of the defendant. So, <clears throat> so this is previously admitted as Exhibit 2. If you could uh, tell me what we're looking at in this photograph. Um, this is a bathroom stall in the bathroom that is just outside of room 258 um, in the 200 wing of the school. And there's some personal effects that you can see in the picture there, a backpack, um, some electronics, um, a journal, um, along with a Gatorade bottom, some other miscellaneous items. Okay. Now, next picture is in the 200 hallway. We're looking down the 200 hallway. We have rooms 258 and 256. And obviously, we have some issues. Which is redacted, but also yellow evidence placards. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yes, this is a photograph taken just outside of that bathroom that we saw the inside of in the previous exhibit. Um, this is a photograph taken to the east um, on that hallway outside of 258 and 256. And the yellow placards are items that were marked as evidence pieces within that crime scene. Now, I want to ask you specifically about what I call shell casings, or fired cartridge cases, is the, uh, that's the official term. Would that be right? That is correct. Okay. How many of those did you uncover, or did you, did you recover, rather, in this portion of the 200 hallway? In front of, oh, outside of 258 and 256, there were 14 fire cartridge cases located. Okay, and, sir, you told us that every time a semi-automatic handgun is fired, it ejects that cartridge case. That is correct. Okay, so that means he fired 14 times? That is correct. In this area, is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, further, following this hallway, following the shooter's path, this is looking at the corner where 249 would be right around to the left of the photograph. This is past room 256 that would be behind us. So um, what do we see in this photograph? Um, you start to see where the, the hallway turns to the left, which would be to the north, um, outside of 249. And you see a couple more evidence placards there that are marked um, with evidence. Okay. Now as, as we turn that corner, we're looking down the long, as long part of the 200 hallway. What are we looking at in this photograph? Um, once again, it's just the, it's the hallway. Um, you can start to see at the top of the, the photograph that this hallway is a curved hallway. It's not a straight hallway. Um, once again, um, the evidence placards were placed next to pieces of evidence that were located within the crime scene. Okay. Now again, specific to those to those cases, uh, those shell casings. This is where 249 would extend to 213. That would be the end of the crime scene. That is correct. Okay. Now, how many of those shell casings were recovered in this portion? Of there were 18 fired cartridge cases between 249 and 213. Did you recover, recover any handgun magazines? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Is that exhibit, or is that placard 35 right here by the laser pointer? That is correct. What is a handgun magazine? What is it? So it, uh, a, mag, a gun magazine, a handgun magazine, would be something that contains those cartridges uh, prior to them being fired. And they are um, inserted into the bottom of a semi-automatic weapon. Um, to be able to be loaded into the chamber of a firearm to be um, expelled through the barrel. Okay. Now you're familiar with the murder weapon from November the 30th, 2021. 
correct? Yes, I am. Okay. Tell us, what is the, the firing capacity of that particular handgun? Um, the magazines, there were three magazines covered from within the scene, and the capacity was 15 rounds per magazine. Okay. So if we see an ejected magazine, that was empty when recovered, right? That is correct. Right. That tells us that he went through the entire magazine, and then he ejected that, and we saw in the video earlier that he then inserted a full magazine to bullets. Is that, that, is that your understanding? Yes, it is. Now, was there evidence that the def defendant turned and fired into classrooms with children and teachers as well? Yes, there was. All right, the next slide here is room 247. Can you tell us, please, what we're looking at? This is a photograph taken from the outside of room 247. You can see there's a pink trajectory rod um, that is to indicate um, where the bullet actually passed through the, the framework of the door um, in 247 into the classroom. Now that rod, we talked a little bit about it earlier with Lieutenant Will Willis. You obviously weren't here for that, but tell us what that rod means. Uh, it's the direction that the bullet actually traveled into that classroom um, you know, prior to my arrival during the crime scene. Okay. Now moving on to uh, room 244, we see another one of these uh, trajectory rods, is that right? That is correct. Okay, so again, this signifies that the defendant turned and fired into that into that classroom? Yes, and this looks to be a small window that was on um, the left-hand side of the door to 244. And we see spider broken glass underneath the sign 244. Prior to the bullet being fired in there, so you're understanding that glass was actually clear, you could see through it. That is correct. Right. And that's other classrooms had that same glass panel right next to the door? Correct. Now this is um, Office 224, this is the office of Ms. Molly Darnell. What do we see here? Um, once again, there are three trajectory rods that are, were inserted into the door of classroom 224, indicating um, the path of travel where the bullets went through the door into 224. Now this is the same classroom, this is also 224. We see the, the part of the office door where the bullet actually went through, and this is just the view inside the that, classroom or office? That is correct. You can see the back side of the door of 224 with the trajectory rods on the other on the inside of the door and then the contents of that classroom at the time that I observed it. So I want to direct you to where I have a laser pointer at the back of this classroom is a file cabinet with an indentation here. Do you, are you aware what that was? Yes, I am. What is that? Uh, it would be what we call ricochet um, or a, a defect. It was in that filing cabinet, uh, most likely caused by a fired bullet. Okay. And this hole here in the window? that was also likely called, caused by a fired bullet? That's correct, we call that a perforation where the bullet actually traveled out and we were never able to recover it. Okay. And in this file cabinet right here with books, a fired bullet was actually recovered there, is that correct? That is correct. Now I'm moving to classroom 223. This is a side-by-side -side view of that classroom. What do we see here? Um, this is a side-by-side a, a -side photograph of 223 and you can see the um, the picture on the right, it looks like it appears to be a what we call a tumbling bullet. Um, it's not a circular, um, in the, the, the pattern is not circular in nature, so it looks like the bullet was actually tumbling at that time. So it had to come in contact with something prior to the, hitting that door. Okay. We have room 220, another rod in the door. What does that signify? Uh, the trajectory rod to show the path of travel of a bullet um, that went into room 220. Okay. And, and last picture here is room 215. You see three rods in that glass pane next to the door? Yes, that is correct. They're orange in, um, in this photograph. The trajectory rods are the same. They're just a different color um, for this one in 215. So this would signify the defendant fired three times aiming at someone past that glass <coughs> pane and went through the glass. That is correct. <coughs> now, did you also process the men's bathroom in the 200 hallway across from room 233? Yes, I did. And that is the location where the defendant killed Justin Schilling, is that right? That is correct. And Judge, I'm going to show one photograph from that from that location. Thank you. Well, this picture was taken from the exterior hallway looking into that bathroom. Can you tell us please what we see here? Um, you see a large amount of blood um, in the middle of this photograph that would be just inside of the bathroom before you turn to actually get into where the stalls and the sinks were. There's also a backpack um, that's indicated by number 50 in the photograph. And then you can't really see it in the photograph, but there is a 
um, some type of defect on the bathroom wall, uh, most likely caused from a fired bullet. Okay, so from your investigation, you learned that the gun was fired one time. You know that it struck Mr. Justin Schilling, and um, the bullet then struck the wall right about here. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Now, the defendant, you're aware the defendant surrendered, and before he did, he placed his gun on a trash can outside the bathroom. Is that what this picture depicts? That is correct. Uh, based upon your crime scene investigation, how many times did the defendant fire that gun on November the 30th, 2021? 32 times. Thank you, Judge. Nothing further. Thank you. Cross-examination. Other than the crime scene at the high school, were you involved in um, the search of the house? No, I was not. Were you involved with processing any of the evidence as far as um, testing any of it? Um, I guess you have to be more specific. Okay. For example, um, if clothing was taken from Ethan, would you have processed that clothing for any type of trace evidence? Um, no, I did not. That's not my area of expertise. Would you have um, done any trace evidence analysis on the firearm? Um, I did check the firearm. And when you checked it, what were you checking it for? For blood. And was there any blood on the firearm? No, there was not. Um, as it relates to your processing the scene at the high school, the photographs and the placards in them are based on where things were found when you arrived, correct? That is correct. It's possible that that evidence could have been unintentionally moved um, by other people that were going through the hallway, correct? That is, a, that is a possibility. Now, did you interview anyone in, the, um, in your investigation of this scene? Did I interview anyone? Correct. No, I did not. Did you take any statements from anybody? No, I did not. Um, and you already said you hadn't been to Ethan's house. Um, were you at all responsible for any of the photographs or any evidence collection there even though you didn't do it personally? I took all the photographs in this case. Okay, so you took the photographs at the house then too? Just at the high school. Okay, so you just said you took all the photographs. So if there were photographs from the house, it wouldn't be well, something I mean, you it, did. Then I, I apologize if I misunderstood the question. I was never at the house, okay. so I could not have taken any photographs there. I took all the photographs at the Oxford High School. Would one of the team members that you testified you supervised take in those pictures? Yes. And would you have been supervising what was collected at the house or what pictures were taken? I was not at the house. But were you telling your team member what to do or how to process those scene, that scene? No, I did not. Um, did you take any, and this may not be, it may be outside of what your responsibilities are, so let me know, any physical evidence from the person of Ethan, such as swabs? No, I did not. Would that have been outside of what your responsibilities were? It would all have to depend on the circumstances and um, if I was needed or they requested it. Um, have you ever met Jennifer and James Crumbly? No, I have not. Do you know anything about Le Ethan's life or his family? Only by hearsay. And by hearsay, would that have been from your team members or other law enforcement officials, or are you talking from, like, press reports? Um, just from my, um, my coworkers in law enforcement. Okay. Um, we know Ethan's been in the Oakland County Jail, correct? Have, that is correct. Have you had any contact with him at the jail? 
No, I have not. And do you know anything about what he's been doing there regarding education? No, I do not. How about, do you know that he's been diagnosed as being mentally ill? I do not know that. How about if he's taking any sort of medication or in any sort of counseling or other treatment for <coughs> mental illness? I don't know that information. Do you know what the Miller factors are? Uh, just a little bit. Um, do you know any of the hallmark features of Ethan's chronological age? No, I do not. Do you have any sort of education, experience, or specialized knowledge um, to talk about hallmark features of a person's chronological age? No, I do not. And you didn't do any investigation of your own as to his family or home environment, correct? That is correct. Now, you also cannot provide any testimony about the effect of any familial or, or peer pressure on Ethan related to this event. Would that no. be true? I think he's already testified that he's a crime scene investigator who was only at the school. Thank you. The court agrees, but I will allow some leeway, but please get to your point this up, but you may continue. Your Honor, my questions are toward the Miller factors and whether he has any information for us about those. Correct. His statement has been he's uh, vaguely familiar with the Miller factors and he's pretty much established that he doesn't have anything to offer directly as it relates to the Miller factors. And so you may continue. I am allowing some leeway. You don't know anything about the incompetencies of youth or Ethan's incompetencies related to his age, correct? That is correct. Don't know anything about brain development, correct? Correct. Um, and you don't know whether Ethan can be rehabilitated, can you? No, I cannot. And do you know what it means to be rehabilitated in the context of criminal law or corrections? No, I do not. And you don't have any experience, education, or specialized knowledge about whether people can be rehabilitated at all, correct? That is correct. How about what it means to be irreparably corrupt? Do you know what that means? No, I do not. Do you, and you don't know any sort of standard for that phrase? No. And you don't know how to determine if anybody's irreparably corrupt, correct? Correct. Um, you haven't met Ethan before, correct? That is correct. So you can't provide us any testimony about what changes he's undergone as a person between November 30th of 2021 and today, correct? No, I cannot. No further questions. Thank you, Reader. Briefly. You're a crime scene investigator? That is correct. Okay. And so you went to the crime scene November the 30th to process the scene? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, you can tell us that the defendant fired the weapon, the 9 millimeter weapon that he used to murder four children. You, he fired that gun 32 times in that shooting event? That is correct. And each time he fired it aiming at a person. Is that right? One would assume. Right. Thanks. Nothing. Thank you. With that being said, any reason why this witness should not be excused? Not from the people. Thank you. None from defense. Thank you. With that being said, sir, you may step down. You may also leave the courthouse. Please don't discuss your testimony with anyone. Thank you, Your Honor. You're very welcome. Next witness is Detective... Ed Wabrowski. Thank you. You may call your next witness. You, what was the next witness's name? Uh, Ed Wabrowski, Detective Ed Wabrowski. Thank you. Detective, if you could, please approach the witness box. Yes, sir. You're going to stand in the witness box. Face my clerk to be sworn, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. One more. Please raise your hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you swear or affirm the statements you're about to make to this court will be the whole truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, and sir, if you could please state your full name for the record and spell your last name. Edward Wagrowski, last name W-A-G-R-O-W-S-K-I. Thank you. People, your witness. Thank you. <clears throat> sir, when you're ready, can you tell us how you're employed, please? With the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. Okay, what do you do at the Sheriff's Office? I'm a detective in the Computer Crimes Unit. How long have you been with the Computer Crimes Unit? Nine years. Tell us, please, what a detective in the Computer Crimes Unit does on a day-to-day -day basis. We do everything, uh, cell phone forensics, we're looking for evidence of crimes on phones, uh, computers, call detail records, stuff like that. Okay. So is it fair to say that someone from the computer crimes unit would be responsible for the forensic examination of any cell phone seized? Yes, sir. Would that uh, um, 
with the task of reviewing um, search warrant returns from social media outlets. Would that fall with computer crimes, generally speaking? Yes, sir. And do you also have expertise in working certain surveillance systems, DVR systems, things of the like? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2020. Sir, do you remember that day? Yes. Were you, were you working that day? Yes, I was. Do you recall getting a call about a shooting at the Oxford High School? I, I remember our captain coming in. Okay. So you were in the office and your captain notified you? Yeah, we were sitting down getting ready to listen to a webinar on forensics, cell phone forensic stuff, and he came in and the phrase he used is, he said there's been a shooting at the high, Oxford High School and he said all hands on deck. What's going through your head at that point? This isn't real. What'd you do? I, uh, I'll be honest, in, in my job I, we're the, we're, people call us the computer nerds and, and I thought this isn't real, it's going to be over by the time I get there. Um, and so I got my, we always take our laptop wherever we go, and I grabbed my stuff and walked out to my car. Um, I remember as I was pulling out of the parking lot, it became very real. I, I looked to my left out of the sheriff's office, 38 East, and the animal control and the medical examiner is down at the far end, and there's two um, mark patrol units from another agency. They come around the corner and their lights and siren are going, and they're going extreme, very fast. And I, I remember thinking, they weren't from my agency, and I remember thinking, I, I knew where they were going. And I said, I thought to myself, well, there's no way they're gonna beat me to a place in my town that I work for. Do you remember the drive? Every minute of it, yeah. Tell me what you remember. I remember there was a lot of chatter on the radio, a lot. Um, I was at 24 in Walton. I went up to Walton, turned right, and started heading north on 24. And uh, it must have been 13, uh, 1, 1 p.m. because I remember them here. I remember hearing them say there's a subject in custody. But I kept driving, of course, license siren, you know. Um, and I remember coming up to the overpass where 75 comes off onto 24, and it, it, everything just seemed so. Again, not real, but very real. And I saw one of our SWAT vehicles going across the bridge, and I thought, oh, wow. Like, you know. And then the light was red right there, but nobody was moving. There was cars at the ramp supposed to be coming off, but nobody was moving. I couldn't figure out why. They, like, I should be slowing down because there should be cross traffic. And um, as I go through, the, go through the red light, I look to my right, and there's some, uh, some agency patrol car. I don't know who it was. And... Uh, and I kept going up 24, Lapeer Road. Um, everybody was filing in behind me. And I, my, my county vehicle, my, my detective vehicle is a, a white minivan. And uh, it's, it's, it's not like a patrol car. It doesn't, it handles different. It handles like a minivan does, not like a patrol car does. And I remember going, the, the next traffic light, the past where the old palace used to be, I think it's Brown Road. And, uh, I remember there was cars in both lanes, and it was the light was red. And I remember thinking to myself, like I gotta, I gotta be safe, of course, and I gotta get around these cars and the shoulders gravel. Like I, I, I picture it like it happened yesterday, and uh, I went off onto the shoulder of the road to get around the cars, um, and I felt I, I, down to the the tires pulling towards the ditch. I felt it, and I go around the cars, and keep going north on 24 and there's cars behind me, patrol cars. I look up at one time, there's maybe six cars. I look up another time, there's 10, like they just kept stacking behind me. Um, and then we got to an intersection. We were past, we were into Orient Township. I can't remember what road it was, but the light had just changed red. And I know everybody heard us coming. You know, we were driving, everybody had their sirens going. So the intersection, nobody moved. But I thought the safest thing to do was to stop in the middle of the intersection so everybody behind me can just go through quicker. Um, so I held the intersection. And then I, I remember I counted 18 vehicles go past me. And then as we got closer into town in that, 
Um, traffic was really bad on northbound. Um, I remember going against traffic. I remember cars coming at us. You know, of course, we're slowing down at this point. Um, and uh, all I could hear on the radio was the staging point, uh, uh, staging area. It was the mire. And so I'm like, I'm just going to keep driving north until I see a mire. I've got to, because I, I don't know Oxford Township at all. And uh, I follow just past the mire. There's a road there. And I remember hearing Ray Road also on the radio. And so I turn onto that road and I got out of my car and another deputy was just getting out of his car. And I, we look at each other like, what do we do now? And we're like, I, I, I don't know. They said something about stationary Ray Road. I go, where's that at? And I remember him saying, you're standing on it. And uh, then we just, I could see kids coming down from where the high school was. I didn't know where the high school was. It was there was a tree line just behind the mire, and the high school was on the side of the tree line. Tell me a little bit about, as you, as you arrived on scene there on Ray Road, you said there was kids? Yeah. Okay. What was your, what was your impression of that? What was their demeanor like? I... At that, I don't know if I paid attention to their demeanor at that point, um, but I remember thinking how unprepared they were. I was freezing. It was cold out. I remember it. when I got out of my car, I put two coats on, and I was still shivering at points, and there were kids with just T-shirts on. Um, I remember seeing one girl. She didn't have any shoes on and just walking along the side of the road in the gravel, and they cut across the – they didn't come down to the drive where we were. They cut across the snow, the hill, and started walking towards the mire. Um, I mean, it looked like everybody was heading down towards the garden center, the far end of the mire from where I was. So where'd you go? Um, not, I, I went to the garden center because that's what I remember hearing on the radio. Um, I, get the, I, I get there, I walk down there because I left my car up on Ray Road, and I get there, um, and there were just, I remember somebody said we got to start collecting names, like get people's names and phone numbers, so we're, Myers gave us like, just opened up boxes of pens and gave us pens and tablets of paper and started, you know, handing it out to people, like, just get your names. And, um, and then they started telling us to get everybody into the into the store. Meyer got on the PA system and basically told if, if you're not from the actual high school, get out of the store, leave your carts where they are. I remember hearing that. And uh, the, uh, so then I, I remember seeing kids just standing around like they like they look like zombies almost like they didn't know and they were telling us to get everybody inside and I remember putting my hand on a couple kids like trying to direct them like come on in trying to be sensitive to the traumatic event they just went through um, I didn't want to force anybody and I put my arm on my hand on a couple people and they just stood there they didn't move nobody a couple went into the school but or into the store I'm sorry um, but a lot of them just stood there, just, just staring. At some point, where did you see buses being dropped off or, or driven there? Yeah, yeah. I remember all of a sudden some school buses started coming around the corner, and and like in moments like that, like you, you know, everything was. Just, I'm just so I was just so hyper aware of everything. And I remember thinking to myself, like that's just like really weird. Like why are there school buses? Like how did they get the buses that close to the school? And just stuff I was thinking about. And I remember. I remember seeing parents just standing there talking, hoping their kid. Parents were looking for their children. Yes, excuse me. Yeah, hoping that their kid got off that school. The school buses that pulled up. Um, I remember seeing a couple of deputies. Their their vans were empty, but it was that was another thing that struck me just absolutely crazy. There were deputies who was, were assigned to court services that showed up in transport vans to check because they have kids that go to the school. Um, I mean, ever that gosh, from the friend of the court unit were there, uh, narcotics unit, everybody, everybody was there. A detective, you were on at the, at the Meyer staging area for, for how long, 10 or 15 minutes? Probably that long. Okay. And at some point, were you redirected to the high school? Yeah, Detective Jeff Anger um, works in the computer crimes unit. Um, had responded right to the school. We didn't follow each other up to the school or anything like that, so we got separated. And he, um, I was a little bit better on the at that time with um, video systems, DVRs, that sort of thing. 
and he didn't want anything to get messed up, wanted another brain up there to help, and so he asked me to come up to the school to help him. So then you went right to the high school in the, the main office area? Yes. Walk us through what happened as you pulled up to the school and walked inside. Um, as I pulled up, there were cars everywhere. I remember having to drive over sidewalks to just get my car close to the school. Um, one of our sergeants was standing at the door um, looking at the uh, looking at the school. The door one is on your right side, door two, and the office is behind the glass wall there. And I walk in the door two, and the sergeant's standing there. He just man in the door, I suppose. Um, and I start asking people where the security office is, and somebody eventually walked me to the security office. I don't remember who it was. Who was in the security office? Uh, their school security guy, Jim Rourke, was there. Um, Jeff Anger was there. Uh, Lieutenant Marsban, a guy from the DEA was there, I don't know his name, <laughs> and uh, Debbie Lewert was in there as well. What were you asked to do when you arrived? Um, we weren't asked to do anything uh, when, when I got there. What we knew we had to do is to secure the video footage of, of the incident, of what happened, because the the bosses are going to want that information to formulate a plan and do all that stuff. So I knew they would be asking for it. So you know, you knew it was incumbent upon yourself as a computer crime detective to, to find the, the relevant portions of the surveillance footage? Yes. Okay. Now, Oxford High School has a number of surveillance cameras, is that right? A lot of them. So they, at some point inside the school, some are exterior? Correct. Okay. It, was it over 90, I think that's the last one? Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, at least 90. At least 90. So when you sat down, I, show me, like, tell me what the security office looks like. I imagine it is a, a bank of screen. No, it's, it's really, I mean, it's no bigger than, than the, shoot, maybe three quarters the size of the seating area you all are. Um, we're looking at it. Uh, Jim Rourke, the school security, had two monitors on his desk, and we're using that to look at, you know, set, you know, one set of cameras up on one screen and one set of cameras on another screen. It wasn't like a bank of TVs and stuff like that. We I remember having to go into a program and launch it and all that stuff. What was the first thing you did in your attempt to isolate and preserve that footage? We knew where the shooting started. Uh, Jim knew where the shooting started, and so we went to that camera and, um, to to try to figure out who the person was and what time they got in the bathroom. shooting started and that was right outside 258 which is right here correct yes okay so with that information tell us what you did in attempt to find the perpetrator we at the at the point where it started when the shooting started we looked we saw what the person was wearing um, and then me and Jim just started backtracking we were trying to find out what time he went into the bathroom and I, I think we spent it was a 20 minutes trying to find him going in the bathroom, and we could never find a black coat, black knit cap going into the bathroom. And, and did you find out why? Yeah, we, we knew who the shooter was. Um, someone told us his name. And so we knew there was a time when he would have been on camera because he was leaving the school counseling office. So after realizing he was in the counseling office, we went all the way back to that time and just waited for him to come out of the school counseling office to see what he was wearing. Right. So you're the individual responsible for putting together this, this the shooting surveillance footage, is that right? Yes, sir. So you, could you put a number on how much time you've spent working with the surveillance footage itself? Oh my lord, I, I, I can, I can't put hours on it, but I can tell you, the only phrase I can, the video lives in my head. So you have a great knowledge of what you've seen on there, you were there on scene that day too, is that right? Yes. Did you actually walk through the school, follow the path of the shooter at some point? Yeah, the, the, the second day, um, I had to go back up there because at first you, you didn't get enough video, we need to, we need to know this, you know? Uh, and there was something that I think the undersheriff at the time wanted me to, to figure out from the video. So I go back up there, and I remember I asked Jim if we could go to uh, where the shooting started, and because I, I, want, I want my eyes to see what the cameras are seeing, uh, really just, like put myself 
in that moment, in that time, in that space to, to better understand everything. So if I could think of an analogy, it would be sort of like a, an officer with a in-car recording system on the patrol car. You capture some of what that officer sees, but you don't catch the peripheral. Would that be an analogy? It's exactly, yeah. So with this, this knowledge that you have, tell me what you see when you, when you that day, November the 30th, you're looking through the surveillance video you're putting together, when it started, where it came out of, and this is, the victims are still being treated at this point, right? Yeah, uh, it was, I remember I got, it was shortly after 1 p.m. I got there and I left, it was well after dark, so I don't know what time that was, how long I was there for. So tell us what you, tell us what you saw put that together. When we were reviewing the video at first, pulling the video? Sure. I remember, at first I didn't know all the people that were involved in it, um, all the victims. Um, but you see the shooter come out of the bathroom and, and I've, I've watched the video so many times, it, he had a sense about him, like, I don't know, I call it like the proud chest. Like he walked out of there like his, his head was held high, like he was, he was in charge. And I remember it was incredibly, his finger was outside the, the trigger guard. Why is that significant? Oh, it's gun safety, 101. You don't put your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to pull the trigger. Okay. Um, and uh, he steps out and he immediately, there's um, Phoebe and her boyfriend Elijah, and he immediately levels the gun at them and then shoots them. And you see Elijah's hair from the, the, the blast of the of the bullet, it, like his hair just, and he's got real curly hair and his hair just poofs up. Um, he then turns the gun to, um, there's uh, Hannah and Kylie and Riley to the on the right side of the hallway. And he immediately turns the gun at them and fires some rounds in their direction. Um, then in fr directly in front of him was John, John Asciutto, um, and I learned all these names after, and he shoots at John. And then as John runs further down the hallway, the shooter stops and he starts, he shoots again at Hannah. Um, and at this point she just completely, she completely falls over. And then he runs down the hallway. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. I can't. I don't know how to describe it. But he he sprints down the hallway and he he puts the gun to he puts the gun to Madison Baldwin's head and you see as he turns to walk away, her body just slumps to the ground. He rounds the corner by door seven where some deputies had come in after. Um, the the sun on the on the, coming through the window, the doors were so bright, you don't see him at first. Um, and then he starts coming into in the focus a little bit more and some, with sun dies down or whatever. Um, and there were two girls, I, I don't know their names, but the one girl, one girl reaches, she, she was a smaller girl, a shorter girl, and she reaches, she goes towards the classroom and she tries pulling the door open. And I would imagine at this time they had engage the locks on the doors to prevent anybody from coming in. And the other girl, she had a backpack on. And she easily could have just ran past that other girl. Um, but she slowed herself down and grabbed that girl. And I, I would save her life, I would say. Um, and pulled her with her. Um, as they're running away, you see the shooter level is gone and fire off a few rounds. Um, in the upper corner of the video you see like appears to be drywall or insulation. Um, it continues on down the hallway, down the the, the 200 hallway. Um, gets to the area right about a little bit further where the, yeah, a little bit more to the right, yep. Gets, gets about that area. Um, just then um, on another camera in the area uh, that they refer to as a cubby, Jim Ward referred to as the cubby. Um, you see two students, one of them 
one of them being Tate, Tate Mirror, and you see uh, the shooter level the gun and fires a round, and just as Tate rounds the corner, he just unbeknownst to we, he didn't know what was going on, he turns the corner and he just immediately falls to the ground. The shooter then uh, walk, continues walking and then before he gets to where Tate is, um, he stops again and levels a gun just to just to shoot Tate one more time. And he leveled the gun and you see Tate's body flinch after he pulled the trigger. Um, he walks past, so Tate's laying in the doorway to to go past and further into the 200 hallway to the right of the picture. And uh, he walks past Tate without a care, didn't look at him or nothing. And he, as he's walking further down the hallway, he sees, towards the top of the frame, you see him stop and he turns to his left um, and shoots, a, fires a couple rounds into an office, I believe it was. Um, and then just continues down the hallway, gets almost all the way to the end, and he had passed a classroom. And the way the classroom is is probably, yeah, right about there. The way the classroom is, the door is to the far right of the classroom, and there's a small window next to that door. So as he would have been walking to his right, or to our right, I'm sorry, um, he wouldn't have seen probably students hiding back in the corner of the classroom. And he turns around because he just walks right past as he looks, looks into that area. And after he turns around, he comes back, and he must have seen students hiding in the back corner, and he just fired more rounds into the classroom. And then he keeps on walking. At this time, uh, the assistant principal, Gibson Marshall, uh, was had seen what was happening, and she was coming up a hall, another hallway, and she's standing at the corner right where Tate was laying. And I, I remember her trying to get his attention. You know, she just used her foot and lightly tapped him, sort of, you know, are you okay? I don't, I don't know what she would have said to him. Um, and, and Tate didn't move. And the shooter had had come back towards the cubby. And it, as he approaches where Tate is now laying and, and uh, the assistant principal is standing there, uh, she wasn't armed. She didn't have anything in her hand. She, well, she had a walkie-talkie. That's all she had. And you see the shooter walk past her and almost, almost in a, I don't know, a sense of, I don't know, shame maybe, I don't know, but he turns his head away from where she is, turns and looks away from her. Um, and he continues back towards the, now the left of our, of the, of the screen to right about there. And then there's a bathroom. Um, and that's, that's where Justin uh, was shot. Um, but he did, there was no indication, unknown why he would have, but he just made a hard right into that bathroom. <clears throat> and then somebody fled the bathroom after Justin was killed? Yeah, 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 Keegan just came uh, absolutely tearing out of that bathroom. I, I, remember, I remember watching, he was running so fast. He was running so fast, the cameras that recorded him, all, it's, all it was on the camera was a blur, he was moving so fast. I'm so sorry, but I have to ask you about Madison again. When he got to her, she was already on the ground in a crouch position, is that right? She was, she was on, on, like if she was on her feet and her butt was on the ground and she was like in a fetal position, leaning up against the, like trying to hide the best she could. That was before she was shot. Then he walked up to her and executed her. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Detective, thank you. You have a perspective that nobody else has. So I'm sorry for that, but thank you. I want to talk to you now a little bit about your your regular job as a computer crimes examiner, a computer forensics examiner. And you've had the opportunity to review the entire extraction report, all the data extracted from the defendant's cell phone. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Now, we did a lot of this with Lieutenant Willis. I'm just going to ask you about a few things. Um, <clears throat> it 
it's already admitted into evidence, excuse me, but Exhibit 55, you had the chance to look through, um, you had a chance to look through um, internet searches, is that right? Yes. Tell me please, item one, November 30th, 2021, 8.34 a.m., what did the defendant search on his phone? Uh, you search, what is the biggest high school in Michigan? And this is November 30th, the day of the shooting, 8.30 in the morning. The day of the shooting, yes. Okay. Item three, what did the defendant search, 8.11 in the morning? On, also on the day of the shooting, he, it's the biggest high school shooting. Okay. 8.11 and 18 seconds on the day of the shooting, what did the defendant search on his phone? He's the, a search for a school shooting. The day before, the night before the shooting, November 29th, 2021, 9 p.m., what did the defendant search? What school shooting happened in 2021? Everything in quotations, those are, those are the words he typed out, is that right? Yes, yeah, sir. Item 12, again, the night before the shooting, 8.49 p.m., what did he search? What are signs to look out for a school shooter? What about item 32, two days before the shooting? Recent mass school shootings. Item 37, this is one week before the shooting. What did he search? Why was a Parkland High School shooting so popular? Item 60, we have a, a name redacted. That's the name of a different school shooter from a different state. November 18th, 2021, what did he search? What gun did someone uh, use in STEM school shooting? a week and a half before the shooting? Yeah, November 18th, yes. Item 75, what did he search? Again, on November 18th, he searched Colorado school shooting. Item 79, on November the 12th, 2021, what did he search? Which school shooter listened to come and get you? November, that's 18 days. <laughs> 18 days, yes. November the 9th, 2021, item 136, what did he search? Have there been any school shootings in Michigan? November the 9th, 2021, item 151, what did he search? He searches Florida school shooting. What about November the 8th, 2021, item 152? He searched how old was... That's the name of a different school shooter? Yes. When he shot the school. What about item 156, November the 7th, 2021? He uh, searched Douglas High School shooting. And this is weeks before the shooting. This is the 23 days. Item 160, what did he search? Again, on November 7th, how many school shootings in Michigan? The last three. Item 164 from November the 6th, 2021, what did he write? What was the most deadly school shooting? Item 172. Sandy Hook school shooting movie. Item 173. Who was the youngest school shooter? And those were all from November the 6th, 2021. Yes, sir. And when your forensic examination of the defendant's cell phone, you also reviewed website history. You can see the, when you look through somebody's phone, you can see what websites they visit. Is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. And um, we're not going to name this particular website. But did you uncover evidence the defendant visited one website in particular that depicts extremely graphic real-life videos? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're aware of the incident in the Oakland County Jail with the courtroom tablet? Yes, yes sir. Did, did you find evidence that he had visited that website before the school shooting, the same website that he visited while he was locked up in Oakland County Jail? Yes, there was. Can you give us a number on how many times he visited that website just in the month before the shooting? I believe it was in in the 20s. Well, if I said 421 times. I'm sorry, I apologize. I thought you meant when he was in the jail. No, that's all right. I'm sorry, yes. on his phone before he was. Yes, there was, there was many, many, many. Okay. Yes. But Detective, you have also reviewed recordings on the defendant's phone. Yes, sir. And did you uncover two recordings in particular that the defendant made of himself the night before the shooting? Yes, sir. Play 
play exhibits 56 and 57. Exhibit 56 is a longer recording. Second, this is a, it's actually video, but it's audio, and the video is just the defendant, he's pointing the camera or the phone at his feet, is that correct? Yeah, you see his two, the tops of his feet. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm just going to play the audio for you, okay? And after, just confirm that that's what you found. November 29, 2021. I thought about this a lot. I can't stop thinking about it. Like, it's constantly in my head. Every conversation I have with someone no matter what, I'm thinking about it, and I can't get it out. It's currently November 29th, shooting up is Oxford High School. I'm in 10th grade there. I've always been fascinated by guns when I was a kid. I always wanted to join the forces in SWAT when I was in 3rd grade. Navy SEALs when I was in 4th. Marines 5th or 7th. Army Rangers. I've never thought of a career. I've never had motivation. I kept lying to myself that there is something out there for me. There was something that was going to make me happy. That was going to provide me a happy, loving, caring life. This, this, this bullshit. It, you know, it's all a lie. I realized that. Oh, in ninth grade, I, I never thought of this. I thought I was going to make it through school and go into the army, but I realized, what's the fucking point? Millions have done it. Thousands have regretted it. Thousands have killed themselves because of, because of it. You know, many come back and not happy, not satisfied. And I'm thinking, it's the only thing I want to go into, but... How will it make me happy? How will I love doing that? How 
how I love. I want it. And then I realize that that's not going to work out. So I was thinking, what, what am I going to do? And I realized all the bullshit that was right in front of me, and I never realized it. I was always the kid who said, work hard in school and you'll get a career in life. But the career is bullshit. And it was right in front of my fucking eyes the whole time. I couldn't see it. The school system is... Their main goal is to put youth just born into this to this world to learn and you know they actually learn fucking good they learn k for five they learn useful stuff stuff about the world that teaches them not how the world is, but how it should be, and how they want it to act be. The teachers brainwash them into what they think is right, and their minds are so underdeveloped that the adults just take advantage of it. And they say that has to be good for humanity. And when you get into middle school, that, that is even more useless. It's just an excuse to wait till the kids grow up. They're, they're wasting years of their life. They're not acknowledged or most likely never going to do unless they become a Nobel Prize scientist or mathematician or the fucking founder of a multi-million dollar environment club and to brainwash they're, they're teaching a working class into this world there was no There's no teaching of working class centuries ago. You know, they're either born into it or they weren't. You were born into a working class, you were forced to work. You weren't born, you helped develop the world. You created technology, you created advances in civilization. I mean, there was only two indifferences and the, the working class rose up. It made everyone a working class. And now, no matter what, you just have to work to do what? We spent 15 years of your life just hard studying and trying your hardest to achieve the best out of anyone in any school. And then you get accepted into college. And you could be rich, so you don't have to worry about it. Or it could put you into thousands of debt and you get a useless job that other people have gotten and you think that it is doing something for this planet you think that all those years of working and you get a job is doing something for the good of humanity it's fucking not it's useless The education system, the government, is just brainwashing people to be a working class. They're all brainwashing them just to fucking work and keep society how it is, but, but people want to go in a different direction. They don't want to, they want to work, but they, I, see that's what I'm not fucking understanding. I'm not dumb enough to fully understand their capabilities. I'm not as dumb as them, so I can't understand, but they want to revolt and became a new class education system that just weakens everything. They want to fucking keep the innocence of everyone. They want to make sure that monsters are a thing. They, they're offended of a horror movie. They, 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 want to, they want to take away what this world is. In this world, it's 
not heaven. There is no heaven. There is no God. There is no Satan. There is no hell. But the world is hell in its own way. People don't think of it. You think as hell is the bottom, earth is the middle, and heaven is the top. But in reality, the earth is just hell. It's always been that, and people want to just forget it. They want to just take away what already is. <laughs> and it's, it's stupid. I'm taking action. People go and protest, fucking take away guns, or make what I'm doing I believe I am one of the first people to do this I'm not only shooting up the school because I'm mentally depressed or mentally ill and have anxiety that struggles me every day but I'm doing it teach a word and all the simplicities I don't fucking know how to say that all the fucking dunces out there that brains are too their skulls are too fucking normal to understand everything unfortunately the people I kill are the people that are killed you know, I'm sorry that their families have to go through this, but it's for the right of humanity. And the course we're going, we're fucked. In 50 years, we're fucked. Nothing's going to happen. Democrats and the Republicans are just going to fight, fight, and fight. And people are keep going to take sides and sides and sides. And some people are going to stick out and say, they're the big banners who don't think of it, but really, they're the main problems. And it's just leading to a collapse. The world worked so hard for thousands and thousands of years. The war happened. Peace was a thing. People understood everything. People understood the logistics of human civilization. The time from 1920 to 1980 was the golden ages of humanity. And some countries may not have been that way. But for the big ones, it was. It was the golden age. Everyone understood the world, but knew how to keep it in order. They knew the differences because war and peace. They knew that they could cooperate and live together. But now people are just they're taking that away. If what I'm doing is an act to show People are taking it away, and I'm trying to preserve it. To show that no one is safe, no matter how hard they work. Your protests aren't going to do anything. They're just words. They're not actions. No one would care if I go up to the school and shut a sign. We're too innocent. Bring back the equality between violence and peace. It would think I'm fucking delusional. But to take action is what you have to do. Action is the only thing out of humanity that has made us this far, has brought us this far in a civilization. In a society, is collapsed. Civilization is no more. People don't see it, but we're in the, we're in the brink of downfall. Like not just the break, but the beginning. Oh, the end, basically. Everyone is born, works hard, and thinks that everything's going to be the same for hundreds of years. The technology will advance and that's it. But that's not how it happens.
When the bell rings to end fifth hour, tomorrow, October 30th, November 30th, 2021, I'm going to walk to the dividend between the boys and the girls' bathroom. I will have my bike jacket on, and I will walk behind someone, and I will shoot a bullet in their school. Yeah, that's my first victim. I'm going to open fire on everyone in that hallway. The hallways are too jam-packed. I will try and hit as many people as I can. I will reload and I will find people hiding. I'm going to teach them a lesson of how they're wrong, how they're being brainwashed. I understand that I'm going to prison for this. Michigan doesn't have a death penalty. I don't want to die. Funny as it may seem, I'm going to kill other people. I do not want to die. I realize how valuable life is. And I realize I broke the code of what's happening. I broke the code. I realize what is actually happening. And these people, they don't have the capabilities of understanding it. And so I'm going to teach the entire nation and the world of what's happening and how we're on the break of downfall. I'm going to be using 6R SP2022. I bring it at Acme Firearms up from Michigan on Friday. It is a 9mm pistol, it takes 15 plus 1 ammo capacity. I have 3 magazines for it. I've worn my mask for too long. I can't take it anymore, I've broke. I've fought it for years and for years lying to myself over and over again. But it's taught me the truth. It, 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 there's no voices in my head. The voices are me. I am the voices. I am arguing with myself back and forth. I have three constant voices and then there's me physically and I'm doing whatever those three voices tell me to do and one of them is always coming up on top and that's the one that's taken over that's what people call the demons there are no demons I am the demon you are the demon there in turn there is a demon in everyone that is the voice the demon will take over There's nothing I can do about it. My life is already on a downfall. If I don't do this, nothing will happen. The world will collapse. I will be in misery. I'll probably just end up in a useless career in the army and killing myself. What use is that? I have the chance to teach the world to become a better place. And I have to take that chance. I've missed many opportunities in my life, and I'm not missing this one. I'm going to try and flee the school for as long as I can until I get caught.
There's so many people who think they're going to live a life, going to go to college, have a great career, get a family, grow old, die happily. But they don't know that in less of a day, they're going to die, and their lives are going to be changed forever. I understand my consequences. I understand that people put me in prison for this. I've already said goodbye to everything. I went for all the phases. I'm surprised I even do it today. I'm sorry for me motivating you, mom and dad. You have trust in me. I made sure you had trust in me and I just disowned you. But you should know it's for a cause. And I am ruining my life and not yours. Help me. Detective, there's a much shorter video that the defendant filmed right after that, is that correct? Yes, that is. Exhibit 57, November 29th, 2021. Oh, that previous video I took. That was bullshit. What I said. I got to have so much fun tomorrow. I have a goal. It is to kill everyone. questions for this witness. Could counsel approach? Yes. Um, yes. 